Hello, Dwarven Army. Thank you for joining me today, painting some war bands. How are you? Let's see. We got the mini up on the uh, the fancy cam, right? Yep, it looks great. Very fancy. I'm here with Mace. Hey. We're uh, painting up some guys that we are gonna soon battle. Uh, so I'm playing around with some colors here. Um, kind of being inspired by the box art, some cool colors, purpley, dark metals, that kind of thing. Um, but let's start from the top. So at home I did a little bit of airbrushing just to get some cool colors. I'm kind of doing an experiment here to just pick a dominant color, get it in the shadows, and do the kind of zenithal thing that's popular nowadays to just get your, uh, your darks and your lights just right on the jump. Um, but doing a color instead of black. So I want them to kind of have this cool vibe. So I picked a purple. Um, but the same thing can be done with a brush. So I left one blank with just a gray primer. Um, so what I used in, through the airbrush is just this uh, ink, this purple ink. Um, so we'll start with that. Get a little bit on my wet palette here. And uh, this is not a precise step. It's just kind of using the, the three dimensions in the model here. I'm just going to flip it upside down and not think about it too much. Just kind of like whatever, just flip it upside down so that you're in the shadows, right? So that's the idea behind this step is when you're looking at the top, you see the highlight. When you're looking below, you see the shadows. So that's what we're doing here just with a brush. So I'm going to leave it upside down. Not think too hard. Just get some, uh, some, some purple in there. And have some logic to it, like as you glance at it, you kind of know where shadows would be, but also sometimes there's some that you wouldn't think of. So just let the angle of your view guide your eye and the dimensions of the model. Down here in the pits, because anything in the step we can cover up. So you really can be sloppy. You just want to get color on the model. Because we were talking yesterday about just getting to the first draft, right? It's the hardest part. So that's something uh, that I'm trying to improve on is just not thinking so hard off the jump, getting self-conscious and all that. Just get colors onto your, your figures. Have you named them yet? I have not named these. What are the names of these guys? Well, I know they're the unmade. This one is the blissful one. So the idea is that, like, agony is a gift from the chaos gods, right? So any pain that we feel is a blessing. So, like, one of the... This guy. This guy is the joyous one. He inflicts the most pain because that's what brings him joy. Um, let's see. Yeah, you can flip it upside, you know, right side up just to kind of see... You know there'd be your your heaviest shadows down in here. We got some of the higher area here. We can clean that up with our light gray or white. Finley Shard says those chaos gods need to be less generous or more generous since Cox Cam. <laughs> All right. We don't want this stuff to take too long. Uh, Forgetting the video that I watched, but someone was saying, no one looks at a model and is like, man, those base coats. You know, so uh, don't be too precious with this stuff. That's a note I get from Erin a lot, is she's like, you know, don't be too particular with uh, this stuff. Just kind of get to uh, get to the next spot where, you're, where you need the precision, because when you don't need it, you just need it for the function. So color to plastic. All right. Coming in with a white. So we have a nice mid-gray as the primer, so we can leave that as so we have kind of three layers, a dark and a light. So I'm just getting the higher points here in white, just emulating what I did with the airbrush. But that's why, so the airbrush, you're, you, if you use an airbrush, you're a compromising, or it's a trade-off, right, for control, for speed over control. But this is a great step to use that in because you don't need a lot of control or precision in this step. So that's why if you have an airbrush, it's uh, great to use for something like this, but anything can be done with a brush as well. And I don't even mind that I'm getting some of that purple in here because that's kind of the color we're going for anyway, so. 
It's mixing with the highlight a little bit. So sketching it out like a drawing. And I like to make the face the brightest. So even I even cheated with the airbrush a little bit and just gave a little extra spritz on the face to make it the brightest point. Uh, Rabbit Burner says, true, but even base code set up the mini for these popping details. Oh, 100%. And that's kind of why I want to experiment with the color. So even as we paint over it, uh, you get some interesting tones still that will appear. So like you, the final color might not be purple necessarily but like so at this test model here i kind of put some red tones in the skin and it's we'll pick it out to be a little more pale too but if you were to eliminate the purple there it would he have even less depth so i kind of like how the the red i use citadel's reichlin flesh shade over this and how i kind of like how it's interacting with the purple um, so getting cool stuff like that where you don't necessarily notice it a ton in the final result But if you were to take it away, you'd be like man something's missing um, So I think I might even call this good Just get familiar with the sculpt that's part of this step too is just What details are on the model? So we'll put that one aside um, And I kind of determined the first couple steps here so we're gonna go from the inside out right so the skin is kind of the lowest layer it's under the clothing it's under the armor so if we go inside out for the, the kind of deepest layer first um, we will we can be less precise so we're kind of we're getting these ready for the tabletop right so we want them to look great but we want the process to be efficient so that's uh, part of that so we're going inside out start with the skin um, and I'm using Citadel Deepkin Flesh over this purplish base coat, and then we'll hit it with that Reichland Flesh shade. So I did mix it with a little bit of a glaze medium. You can use any thinner, even water works fine, just to keep the transparency so it's not too thick, so that we keep some of this underpainting that we did with the purple. We don't want to cover it up entirely. We want it to work for us and give us those nice values. Um, so there's a few comments about the airbrush. It's uh, Rabbit Burner starts with saying that, oh, we already went that one. Uh, airbrush is fast, but changing colors in an airbrush is really slow and that it has you have to sacrifice nice results for control and vice versa. Yeah, definitely. And that's definitely something that you can get down. Like, as you practice your process for changing colors, sometimes you, you know, you can speed it up. And if you use light colors, sometimes you don't even have to wash out the airbrush. I've done that before. If there's close colors, you can kind of let them interact. So that's kind of something I'm trying to experiment with here is letting this odd underpaint interact with all the colors on top of it. So it's not just like, I expect this to appear on the model, how it is in the pot. It's like, how do they combine to do interesting things? But you're right, that definitely takes, well, and, and honestly, that's part of why I've tried do, using the airbrush here at Dwarven Forge. And uh, it has its uses, but for the volume that we do when we have these piles of prototypes so we can build out these giant builds, um, it's not always the best tool just because it is it does like to get clogged and you have to do a lot of that cleaning. So that is an example of kind of when it's just more efficient to use the brush when you're doing a, dozens and dozens of pieces. But I'm super pumped to be painting some Warhammer. That's where I started. I started playing Warhammer Fantasy Battles with Dwarves. Warhammer Dwarves. You don't even, you can't even see any of the skull back there. Um, so that was my first fantasy love, was just dwarves and heavy armor and big heavy weapons. You kind of work at the right place then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it says, people are saying that it's not really a replacement, it's just a good tool, and that it's another art form entirely in some people's opinion. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Just a tool that has its uses. Let's see. 
I'm just building up the layers here a little bit because we want some opacity. It's not necessarily full opacity. Don't forget the little chin in here. So where did you first learn to mini paint? Well, let's see. The first, the first place I learned was in my mother's basement when my cousins got me my first miniature because they would bring the rule book, the Warhammer rule book, with a bunch of cool photography in it to all the holidays. So I'd be like, did you bring the book? Did you bring the book? And I'd look at all the cool pictures. And then finally, when the, the holidays came around, you know, Christmas time and that, they got me my first miniature. And man, was it bad. I just slapped, just, you know, well, it was like a coloring book. It was just like solid colors across the whole, it wasn't so bad. But uh, that was my first foray. I don't know if any of you remember like the bright red Citadel brushes. Uh, but then I finally got, actually, Rabbit, I mentioned this to Rabbit Burner because he sent me a photo of his gaming hobby area. And he, I was like, is that the box from like the old... Empire Orc starter set. That was my first big set. Once I got that first blister, I got the big old set Orcs and Empire. Painted those guys up. Quickly went to Dwarves though and I used the Orcs head on uh, on the banners. I bloodied up an Orc head. <laughs> Your first kill. My first kill. But I didn't get into like advanced stuff until honestly when I started working here a couple of years ago because I kind of fell off of the hobby when I went to college and stuff. Um, so I would look at YouTube and stuff. But I did the very basic base shade wash sort of thing growing up, which worked well because you know you got to get get armies on the battlefield. But now I've been interested more in like doing the, the cool stuff like this with the airbrush tricks and the underpainting and things like that. So I'm still learning, but um, it's definitely more fun adding tools to the toolbox, you know. And, and Mace, you have been doing a little mini painting yourself. Yeah, I've, I've dabbled, uh, not to put a pun on it, but I do dabble a little bit. You, I've only done the one, like, actually trying very hard, and all the other ones have been kind of tests and failures. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing, right, is you're like, that looks horrible, and then you keep working at it and picking at it, and you're like, okay, that works. But I was super impressed, but she did this awesome raccoon face that turned out freaking sweet. Yeah, I, yeah, I still need to work on my metal, but, like, uh, I don't know. Actually, looking back at that, I remember that day I spent almost like two hours probably just looking at that face and being like, but where are the whiskers, man? And it's like, not it's the size of my thumb. Right. And now when I go back, I'm like, oh, yeah, that does the job. Like, I don't know. It's being too much of a perfectionist. Like, you can't actually yes. paint a whole tiny animal. Yeah. Um, so Rabbit Burner says that he almost got that box that you mentioned off of eBay, off of eBay mostly complete. And then we this have. Is still drying. I'm gonna... <laughs> Finley Shard says, I fell out of war, uh, GW when they started to move to a you need X character model to win rather than it being primary rank and file size. Yeah, I do miss the, the big blocks of units. It was kind of fun to see those on the battlefield. I haven't gotten a lot of games in an Age of Sigmar, but I have purchased a lot of models. Yeah. Buying stuff is a different hobby than painting it, I'll tell you that. And I am great at that one. Which one, buying or painting? Definitely buying. <laughs> you, you Definitely, I'm a, I'm a great trace, buyer, so. yeah. I'm a great miniature buyer. In fact, I'll tell you what. I I was not in the Kickstarter world a lot before I, I started working here. And then this past year has been an excessive year for miniatures Kickstarters for me. Because uh, I just think, like, everything looks cool. 
So I'm like, well, I have to have that. And then that's the last one. And then another one pops up. Uh, Dab1800 says, what up, folks? What up, dude? <laughs> and then Finley Shards, um, Rabbit Burner saying, no rank and file in AOS. Yeah. Um, oh, I think Drew is actually Live to Sculpt, but I could be wrong, but Live to Sculpt I says, think that's oh, him. hammer, nothing, nobody's stopping you. <laughs> uh, ooh, Orcs in Space has a hot take with, I actually think a lot of GW models look stupid. They, they, they do kind of get a little wacky sometimes like but that's their vibe sometimes right is like just going all out crazy sometimes going ham going ham <laughs> exactly uh finley shard says we still do some war gaming but not using standard army lists we use the army gaming whfb to represent large-scale skirmishes battles for our lark campaigns all my mini collecting now though is really for ttrpgs and then a little fake that's sweet. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to build up my collection of just like odd miniatures to play for RPG characters or like Frost Grave campaigns. Uh, a friend of yours, Jazz Ambassador, says, How many miniatures do you have at home? Ugh. Like unassembled in the box? Like literally at least 300. Oh, SA just joined us for this special occasion. 300? <laughs> How many points is that? Well, I sent you that Night Hunt army. That's like 2,000 points. That's like 75 models, right? And I have... <laughs> Hashtag going ham. <laughs> yeah. I have at least three, four armies in the box. Plus additional like RPG stuff. Uh, Nate Taylor, DF. Hey! He says, Hamster, can you explain the color theory behind why purple is the greatest color in the multiverse? Yes, absolutely. It, it actually uh, gives you the most magical power, the most magic behind your spells. It gives you a bonus to every spell cast, every swing of your weapon, and uh, boosts your charisma in romantic encounters. Uh, what, what article are you citing for this all this from? Oh, this is personal research. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why I picked it here, because uh, I'll play these against you and uh, own you. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, and I feel like kind of weird say, saying it, but Cos X Cam says, I remember reading something about the fact that buying models is an instant gratification while painting is really labor-intensive yes. to get into the same place. And that's why so many people buy way more than they can paint. <laughs> yes, that I, guilty as charged. Uh, like, the amount of times that I've spent hobby time sitting, staring at the unopened models, like, thinking, like, oh, I could do this and this, and then I just have to buy this to complete the project, and then not even picking up a brush, it's... It, it's yeah. So what, so often. what part of the process are you doing right now on this mini? I'm doing the skin. I'm doing a batch. I'm, uh, for excitement's sake, I might just batch this step and maybe just complete this one so we get a little taste of uh, where we're trying to get to. Um, that says going ham to the stir, and Finley Shards has you beat with 500 or so uh, painted at the moment. Painted? Yeah. Holy but smokes. But 11K minis total. 11,000? 11K, yeah. I give up. He won. <laughs> he or she or they Yeah, that is some gratification, really. Uh, yeah. It really kicked in. So you were saying you're putting the skin base on it? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to build up these transparent layers of the deepkin flesh over the purple. I can be a little more aggressive, probably. Like, I'm trying to keep it thin, but now it's taking a little long. I'm getting a little finicky. Uh, Lift Sculpt says, I call unpainted miniatures my clean reference sample. <laughs> Winky face. Oh, AK Yeti is back. He's the person that Hey, won nice. Congratulations. He said, any trade trips for better micro details like eyes and logos? Any what? Uh, trade tri tips. Oh, for eyes and logos. Yeah, you know what? Tips of the trade. We saw that sorrow nest yesterday with the little black dots. And I did not use a brush for those. I used the tip of a mechanical pencil and dipped it in the paint and just dotted it. I've heard that whiskers are also... Whiskers for very fine stuff could do. I mean, you could also just cut down a brush with a knife, like an old brush, and just leave 
a single bristle. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I had a pencil randomly in my brush cup, my cup of brushes, um, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to try that. And so the, the tip is, or the trick is to uh, not like press all the way down so the lead leaves a crater. You just kind of tap, there's a little bulb of paint, and you just tap the edge of the bulb, but the pencil doesn't even hit the miniature, but um, that worked pretty well, I was surprised. What's like the finest detail? I know eyes are very tricky and cumbersome, but like since you've been able to like go into depths with your minis and almost never give them up, what's like the the finest hair that you've been able to cut? I I mean honestly, I think it's eyes. It's one of the, it's always the smallest like detail as far as the sculpt usually. Um, I have done some freehand stuff, but. It's not necessarily that that small and fine. It's normally because it's normally in like a large flat area, like a shield or something. So it, it feels easier than the eyes. I mentioned the Games and Gears has these brushes too. One of them's called the Katana. That's just a rubber tip. So it kind of works similarly to that mechanical pencil, um, where it's not meant to hold paint like the bristles are or hold moisture. It's just meant to to let the paint rub off of it, like run off of it, so you just dab it, and it will, uh, you know, not have moisture spill onto the surface because you only need such a small area. Uh, Rabbit Burner says that his pile of shame is nearly 20 years in the making. Oh, and man. then hashtag dab from Jazz Ambassador. <laughs> I think she wants you to dab. Are you willing? Let's see. We that should be like a contest. Like what what <laughs> what earns the dab, right? If we can get a hundred viewers on this stream, <laughs> at a hundred viewers, I'll I'll dab. Okay. But Mace, what's a dab? Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> you know what a dab is. All right. You don't walk in these office doors, <laughs> plain Jane. I've seen you dab before. Have you? I don't know if I have. I maybe. I'm not have. often a dabber. <laughs> you haven't dabbled in dabbing. I haven't dabbled. I haven't dabbled. 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 Dabble. <sighs> well. A lot of people have a lot of hype for Deb, so... <laughs> All right, 100 viewers. Yeah, we'll Share see. the link. Um, Drew says faces are the trickiest yeah, in definitely. every medium because we care about faces the most. Well, it's a yeah. psychological thing. We are more, uh, much more forgiving about slightly off arms or feet, but faces look wrong very easy. Yeah, it's like a recognition thing where if like the coloring or, or the proportions are a little bit off, when you look at it, you, don't even, you might not even know why. You're just like, oh, that's... That looks weird. Well, it kind of makes me think of how Sophia the robot. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. What is about. that? <laughs> oh, it's a robot that was made, but. She, oh, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Very off putting. It was made like very real, too realistic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like too realistic while still being. It's. I the, think it's going to be the same as that like video of the lion cub seeing a animal lion computer thing. Right. I haven't seen that, but how did the lion react? Uh, it, the baby Confused. cub was cute, and the mama lion picked it up, but I think they all have cataracts, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, you heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Boo! <laughs> no. So what's the uh, purpose of the device you're using to hold it? Um, this is just uh, a handle because it's easier than pinching something together like this, and you can, like move it around a little more easily and it keeps you from like touching the model that you're painting because you can pull wow. paint off with your oil. You don't need a fancy thing. Actually on my desk there's, I can see it from here, there's this poster stick stuck to the top just like, you know, removable sticky putty stuff and it's on top of a vitamin bottle, a beverage bottle, an empty can, and a pepper shaker. So you can use anything you can just hold and you can stick it on top but I just grabbed this thing because that's what I used for the airbrushing this morning so hmm. just a handle it's easier to it's grip and hold on to for a long time one. this is the, yes, the fancy one okay. Drew uses wine corks so. wine corks that are also that's very useful fancy, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, GW mini holders are very useful says rabbit burner yes and yeah. then Cos X cam I think in relation to the robot we were talking about says it's the same reason for Pareidolia, I hmm. think, uh, but he says we're programmed to recognize people's faces so we can emphasize. Yeah. Empathize. Definitely. Also, Are you empathizing with these miniatures? Look at their faces. How do they look? Uh, I would feel less bad if they weren't so threatening. <laughs> 
I'm not gonna feel bad for you though on the the war floor. <laughs> Guys got a lot of skin showing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we're gonna cut to a break eventually and get a closer up on the minis. It looks oh, cool. good now, but we need to get like. I yeah. So once I finish the skin, all these, I think I'm just gonna bring this up to. To done, Wonderful. so we can have that. Yeah, cool. It'll be more fun. Hit a little benchmark. Well, so what paints are you using right now? Well, I tried to kind of bring a selection. Okay. Um, for the skin, I'm using Citadel. I only have a handful of these left. I used to, you know, they used to be all I had back in the day when I was just buying Warhammer. And that's what I had. I have a couple Scale 75 paints um, that the the blue cloth will be. Another Citadel, some Vallejo model color metallics. Um, Army Painter washes are good. Um, the paints are okay, but these washes are are pretty nice. Um, it looks like, yeah, even one of these is actually a Vallejo, like, closer to the Percorni formulas. So I haven't tried this one yet, but I wanted a magenta. I was like, you know what? I'm going to try that out. I um, remember the first time I opened a Vallejo, I was, like, the guy that I borrowed it from was like, open it gingerly, because if you go too hard, it will spill everywhere. <laughs> yeah, like sometimes, sometimes the, uh, they get clogged up here and you start squeezing it will just squirt out like squirt gun uh dab 18,000 would like oh 1800 pardon me uh i would like to know where the mini that nate asked you to paint oh that is nate's hero forge custom mini of a character of his called mraul a tabaxi and i actually was mean to ask him i need a refresher on the physical appearance but i know he has a really fancy hat with a big feather coming out of it of oh, many fine. colors. <laughs> Have you ever played a game with Mural? I'm not sure if he's appeared. I think uh, it was in a, I think a play test of something before my time here. I played with Mural. You did? Yeah. Oh. I have not had the pleasure. I've only heard tales and legends. He, uh, he's kind of like an a well actually cat. A well actually cat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's just telling you so over Well, he's there? a curious cat, yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've not had the pleasure yet. So do you paint your own minis for D&D, too? Uh, yeah, I mean, my group right now doesn't actually uh, use minis. Because uh, we have, you know, tiny coffee table syndrome. But I have painted stuff for D&D uh, &D and the like. I painted some of the WizKids stuff. Uh, the uh, I've painted minis. What was that? Descent into Doom, the live play of the, or, or the taped play of Dungeon of Doom. I painted those. The Hellscape ones you said you did. Uh, let me see. I don't remember what what did they use. Some of them I, I might have painted. Some of them might have been pre-painted. I just remember the Howling Devil. I think. Oh, that stuff yeah. I did. Yeah, like yeah. our stuff. No, no, for no sure. I know. I don't remember what minis they used. Um, All I can remember from that stream is the Howling Devil. That yeah, was that insane. was cool. And of course, Nate's role play of that character was awesome. Yeah, very loud. Peak the audio. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but we didn't have a soundboard at the time, so. Uh, do you have a favorite monster or race types, particular to texture or paint, like fur, scales, or metal, or leather? Hmm. I, you know what I like to paint? What do you like to paint? Tell me. Power armor. Okay. Like space marine stuff. And I know it's crazy, because it's all a bunch of edge highlighting, which is tedious. And I agree, but I think the effect is so cool when you really nail it. All right. I'm going to get back to this guy so we can... Hit a, but I do like leather. I, I've been experimenting with adding more textures, right? And like basically different forms of contrast that aren't just light to dark. Um, so having smoother surfaces, more matte and textured surfaces. Um, so I do like old leather, trying to render that. Leather um, was really hard for me. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, but. It's kind of one of those things where you can just add layer on layer on layer and like go over your mistakes and it will actually work in your favor in the end result. It's kind of cool. 
Have you ever painted something that's not a mini? Like, not just like a wall painting or something, but... Pinewood Derby cars. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Model rockets. Cool. Um, I tried painting like a traditional canvas painting of a big old pheasant. How'd it go? It, I got partway through the pheasant and then stopped. I think it still is at my mother's house. <laughs> Unfinished. Um, so I thought I would get into that for a while, but I don't know. I just like miniatures. I don't know why. I think part of the, the thing that drew me to painting minis is the fact that you do get to play them in their game, so it's not the journey doesn't stop at the painting, right? Like you have a history with them of how much work you put into it and the, the backstory you thought of that went into the color scheme and that kind of thing, and then you see them on the table. Um, Absolutely. Well, also you kind of buy them with the intention to eventually play. Right. So that's another hook in getting them, but... Yeah, there's something about playing with your own mini that makes you kind of like, oh, did you notice who I brought to the table? Right, right. It's like bringing caviar to a party. <laughs> I haven't had that experience. Have you? Are you a caviar person? I I can't eat caviar. Oh. But I'm sure it, that's exactly what it feels like. I'm more of a hummus to the party kind of girl. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't like hummus, so I appreciate the uh, support. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh Rabbit Burner says edge highlighting can be a pain. Never ever get it looking good on camera sad face. Yeah, it's tough. But, but I'm trying to kind of, sometimes I just have space marines lying around on a, a handle like this just to pick at once in a while. And sometimes you can be a little selective with the edge highlights. Like as you get higher toward kind of the face and the focal point, you can pick out more of them and do less and less and less to the point where like the boots might not even have edge highlights at all. Um, and you you will hardly notice sometimes, especially if it's a gaming model. Let's see. Oh, I already have some of this lead belcher on here, I think. I want purple on the mask. Oh. So I've started doing the black on the handle here. Let me finish that up. Yeah, I want to get at least one of these done because we might paint these over a couple streams. Are you planning on finishing this one tonight? This one I want to get done, I think, just to I nail down the colors and, uh, you know, have something to look forward to when they uh, just imagine the whole war band together. Yeah, get a, a like, consistent kind of feeling going. Right. I'm just going to nail some of these straps out in black, just keep it simple. So we already have some cool colors going on in the other areas. I know I've seen some of Rabbit Burner's awesome like Titans. Like imagine a model that's like literally this tall, Mace. It's like I, over six. It's like six inches at least. I've seen, so I've seen people painting models like that on Facebook that I thought were the small ones, and they did such intricate details. I was like, okay, I should just quit. <laughs> That's insane. Honestly, I feel that way all the time. <laughs> like, looking at Instagram and stuff, there's just so much cool stuff out there, and they'll yeah. just do full-on murals. It also kind of inspires you. Oh, yeah, for sure. Where it's like, I can't be that good. It takes practice. But then on the other side, it's like, but no. <laughs> right. <laughs> I feel that. I feel that with video games. Because it, it's, it's cool... But also, it's a blessing and a curse because my computer is right, it's like the same desk as my hobby desk. So I always have a choice yeah. <laughs> of one or the other. And you know, sometimes World of Warcraft is just more accessible, easily accessible. Um, OSL is a lot of fun to play with, but you really have to plan it from the beginning of the model for a nice look, says Kazak Kim. Yes, I love OSL. A little bit goes a long way. Just like a little lantern. One of the little WizKids wizards, I just did a little, you know, coming off of his spell effects and that kind of thing. It really adds a lot. And then he also says the Reaper Bones Mall of Drakkar was a monster to print for the end of my, monster to paint uh, for the end of my Tyranny of Dragons campaign. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, Bones has some good stuff. You know, I, I did a little bit of OSL 
on the Cerberus Warhound because it's standing on lava, right? Yeah. And there, there's also kind of fire effects in its mouth. So there's a little bit of OSL happening. And we actually mentioned we have a blank one with the LEDs in it that has to get painted. So we'll probably do that on a stream so we can do some OSL stuff. All right, I got the boring black leathery kind of areas done. Maybe I'll do one more. So he has a name though clearly, right? This guy? Yeah. Oh, you mean Harold? Oh yeah, yeah, Harold. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's a he's a new guy. They're like, here, can you hold a spear? He's like, I think so. <laughs> Give me a shot. I'll put it in my satchel. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's one of those situations where you look at him and you're like, I know I've met Harold before. Right. So you say, what's your name? And they say Harold, but you're like, oh no no no, the last name. <laughs> And then you say, smooth. Right, right, right. No, yeah, obviously I knew your first name, but what's your, yeah. Yeah, yeah, obviously. And he's like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to have to poke you with this thing now, this big spear. And you're, uh, what do you say to that? HR. No, oh, no. <laughs> the, the glimmering weapon. He's brandishing at you. Okay. Still HR, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, you're not convincing me that I don't need to hit an HR button. <laughs> Like, what do you do when someone brings a spear to the party? I show them my hatchet. Because <laughs> either it's going to be a really good conversation starter or a conversation ender. Right. It's up to them. Yeah. That's a good point. It's up to them. Leave it's it up point. to them. What? Nothing. It's a pun. <laughs> Ignore me. <laughs> Uh, Finley Shard says, ooh, the Hellhound model looks really great. Looking forward to adding that to my collection. Yes, I love that model so much. It's super fun to paint. That's the Momo one? No, no, no. Or the, the, the oh, Cerberus yeah. Warhound. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think Momo made it this time. but. Right. He's still hanging out somewhere. Yeah. Jazz Ambassador says, don't bring a spear to a knife party. <laughs> yeah, that's just etiquette. Yeah, bring a gun. <laughs> Dummy. <laughs> Duh. did bring a gold I think maybe for like the spiky bits like the halo-y bits will be like a brassy gold so maybe I'll do that on these spiky bits I have a question for you yeah so I before have done a suit so one of my characters is like sewer kind of yeah and I tried to make her copper suit tarnished mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had like any helpful advice like, like the verdigris sort of stuff work. yeah like to make it kind of look either worn or like completely like rusted well rusted you know it's a lot of and like the the verdigris and stuff you're just gonna take your bright blues your oranges i don't have one over here but just uh thin them down with water or medium and let them run into the cracks Kind of like a wash almost, but you can okay. be a little more selective, like poke it into the pockets where it would collect and then let it dry and do that more and more and more. You can even l let some be thicker paint for the heavier stuff and just pick the pockets that would collect, you know, water and stuff that would let make those effects happen on metal and uh, just keep poking at it until you get the effect. Sometimes if you want it a little lighter, you know, you'd only do one or two spots, but if you want it completely worn out, it will be almost exclusively that orange rusty color so in that case actually you could start with an orange rusty color as a base and then just pick out a few areas of metal that have worn off you know chipped away the rust on I top if it's really heavy yeah i also tried to look at kind of i don't know like photos of how copper actually works and there's a lot of different styles it could have gone with yeah so that was one of those things where i like overdid it and then now i look at it and it's like oh it's it's fine right it passes uh people want to see your beautiful face but the white balance is apparently i look like a ghost we were working a out bit like a ghost <laughs> Yeah, we're working on our uh, lighting setup. We're hoping maybe we're going to have a break where we can fix it. We can try. Like we, we just really wanted the lighting on the model, obviously, to be good. But then we're having issues with the webcam showing me off well. Yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> it's an easy fix. We'll get there, yeah. No, but you, I don't think you looked it up, but you do look like the label of a wine. 
that I've had before. A wine label? A wine label, and the wine is called Sweet Bitch. Uh, sorry, <laughs> we should like, mark this. I know, we should bleep this out, but if you Google that, uh, it just, you, all you see is eyes. <laughs> that's hilarious. It does not taste good, but it gets the job done. <laughs> So for the helmet, the mask thing, I'm going to hit it with the metallic, but then wash it with that purpley color to give it a color, but let it be that shiny metal still. My brush is too wet. If you want to see my face during the break or something, you can check out the VOD from the uh, interview Q&A streams last night. Because that's up, right? As a VOD? Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Frostbite. I Frostbite. Okay, yeah. Is it Minnesota? Yeah. He says I love everything about this. <laughs> that's my best friend. I'm the I'm the best man at his wedding coming up. Oh, that's awesome. Congrats, and then Frostbite. <laughs> He's a great guy. Went to college with him. He's a theater guy. He's in two shows right now. Back home. Both of them musical theater. Oh yeah. Oh yes. He was one of the best dancers at our school. And a great singer too. That ain't me. I ain't a dancer. Yeah, but uh, you keep threatening that you can do a pirouette. I can, in the most generous sense of the term, do a pirouette, technically. Yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> I, um, I know you can do it, but you oh, can believe missed. that you can do it, too. Well, that is the trick, isn't it? Yeah. It's all in the belief. I am going to put the brassy gold on this big old ornate buckle, too. Just Die says, good evening. Hello, welcome. All right. We're getting pretty close, because after this, I think we're just going to wash up the metals. And then it'll just be the base. So I have some of that gold here. not like the amount of moisture in the brush. Anyway, what time is it? It is 7.44. I was trying to think. I think Frostbite, I guess he'd be on his way to his show. Oh, nice. Wait, you said that you had a little too much paint on it? I had too much moisture water in the brush. Okay. The belly of the brush, you know, holds a lot of moisture, and uh, certain paints, depending on the color and the pigment, will behave differently uh, and need different amounts of moisture to kind of act how you want them to on the model. So metallics are a little finicky. They're sometimes a little thicker, sometimes a little runnier. The, their opacity is weird because the there's actually metal flakes in the metallic paints. Oh, wow. So they're, they're like big physically compared to other pigments so sometimes they're, it's hard to get uh, an opaque layer what do you do to fix that you just got to keep doing more layers so that's why i thought i'm going to get a little moisture out of the brush because you don't really want to thin them down too much unlike other paints like you kind of do want to thin most paints down but not metallics usually just because you want them to stick to the model since they have different ingredients in them so they don't stick to the model quite the same way Can you pull the mini out a little bit further away from me? Like this? Uh, further away from me. Like this? A mini? Oh, wait, that's perfect. Sorry, I was looking at the, the stream. Whoops. So even out here, I can still see a little bit of the purple in there, and I like that. I keep bending these spindly weapons. My finger. 
Yeah, I don't know how to fix that either. I think a lot of people have that. Fix what? Like a bent weapon. Oh, no, this one, I just, like, is sticking out. This is hard plastic, so it'll go back, but... Okay. Um, on that softer plastic, like the WizKid stuff, I think you can almost, like, warm it up with, like, warm water. You can literally dunk it in some warm water and then reshape it and let it cool. Cool. And that will work. But sometimes you just can't avoid that with that kind of plastic. But with this stuff, they're a little more fragile. So, again, it's a trade-off. I need a little more lead belcher because, of course, this happens all the time. But you think you're done, and then you're like, wait, I forgot a little thinger. One of the little bracelets. But, you know, as you go across a warband, you kind of learn what to look out for, what details they will typically have. So it's like, hey, look at the wrists for the wristbands, right? So for somebody that's starting, what's some of the equipment that you would suggest they have? What's necessary in your opinion? Um, keep it simple. Just get some uh, synthetic brushes. They're really cheap. These came in just a pack of a bunch. Um, you want to look for this color, the golden Taclon, because they're just a little snappier. Um, they're my favorite. I don't like the softer ones that are the dark brown bristles as much on like the 3D figures. Um, so these are my favorite synthetics. Um, and they're going to wear out on you. But that's kind of the point. You just get a bunch of them because they're really cheap and beat them, beat them up and uh, replace them. And then eventually you can get to a Kalinsky Sable like natural hairbrush, which will keep the point. Like the synthetic brush bristles, once the point gets messed up, you kind of can't go back. But the other ones will last you a long time. So anyway, I'm getting off track. But So just get a pack of, I'd say, well, this selection right here, 4, 2, 1. You don't, people think that you need really, really tiny brushes, and you actually don't. You just want a fine tip because you actually want a belly in the brush. I could paint this whole miniature with a number 4 almost because you need moisture in here to keep the paint from drying out on the tip. Um, so you only need a few. In, uh, in these side, this is even a six here that I, that I took out that you could use. Um, so golden tackle on brushes. Um, you know, you want a, a black and an ivory or a white. Um, I think the best way to start, honestly, is pick a model that excites you and then think about the colors and pick out those paints. Like just let the excitement of your first project, uh, you know, affect your, your choices. So go to your store and whatever paints they have, pick out the colors you want. If they have a couple different brands, pick out a couple from each. Um, don't just like buy the whole set, like the whole Vallejo range. Just get a handful that you're excited to paint on a miniature that you're excited to paint and start there. Because um, you'll, you'll gather materials as you go and learn your favorites, but they, they act pretty similar to each other. So just keep it simple and give yourself a project that you're excited about and get the materials for that specific project. Um, I would start with a wet palette. This one is giant, but you can get a smaller one. Um, it's basically, you can make one out of Tupperware. It basically just keeps your paints wet, so you don't just gloop it onto uh, a piece of paper and it dries up. Um, this will keep them thin, and make them easier to work with, and they will last longer. You can put the lid on this thing and these will last for weeks um, and stay wet. So it's a little easier to work with the paint that way. Um, you can make one out of Tupperware, just put a paper towel on the bottom of a little sandwich box and then get parchment paper, baking paper, put on top of it. Not wax paper because moisture can't get through it. Um, but just paper towel, parchment paper, Tupperware, wet palette. Finley Shard says that you should also pick a model that isn't huge to start. Isn't huge, yeah. Something like this, like a uh, humanoid-sized kind of figure. You know, like maybe it's your D&D &D character or something like that. Just something that's going to get you to the paint desk. That's really the biggest thing is, is something that's exciting and that gets you th generating ideas so that you sit down and paint. Because we were just talking about... I even love painting so much, and sometimes it's hard to be motivated to sit down and paint, right? Mm -hmm. So you need that uh, behind you as well. Let's see. Since I did get this extra lead belcher out, maybe I'll get these little suckers. 
the sort of stitching. Don't gotta do too much work on them, but just make them slightly reflective with the metallic, just so your eye sees them, your eye catches them. Dwarves were the first war game you played? Yes. Okay. Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Dwarves. Did you play with them? Oh yes. I played it I played a my first tournament with them when I was maybe in like sixth grade. That rule book, man, that was a giant convoluted <laughs> tome. And I literally it was like above my reading level. I would just read it front to back and not remember anything and just start immediately over like turn the last page and then flip it back over and read it again thinking one day i will remember all these rules <laughs> no that's what i kind of did in college it's when you like read stuff and then you just can't retain it anymore yeah i kind of still do that with warhammer books but i don't know i find that youtube helps you kind of know oh yeah nowadays there's a lot of like live play and it's it's fun because you and I, like, we, the systems we play, we've both been new, and it's like, at a certain point, you just have to try it. You just have to play yeah. it, and it comes as it you goes go. Pretty, like, it's pretty simple to pick up, too. It's just, it's intimidating to start with huge textbooks worth of stuff. Right. Uh, Crossax Cam says, starting out, you want something relatively simple. I usually usually teach people on stuff like skeletons. A skeletons. Metal, a little cloth, but mostly bone. Well, and, and it, it's those kind of easy techniques that don't require pre precision that work really well on those, right? Like where you can just wash and dry brush a skeleton and it's gonna look freaking amazing because it's gonna pick out the rib cage, right? And the dusty look will work in your favor. Um, so it's, it'll give you a satisfying result with uh, pretty simple techniques. Same with like fur and stuff. You can dry brush. Uh, Finley Shard says that his first minis were from the Hero Quest board game. Yeah. Have you played that? I haven't played it. That was a little bit before my time, but I've seen a lot of the models and it, you know, comes up a lot in the uh, hobby groups. So I've seen the images and stuff of that. So it looks really cool. Is there a band that you don't have that you want to paint? Let me think. We have four of them. Oh yes, yes. What are they called? The ones with the fans. Um, Are you asking me? I'm just thinking out I loud. Say, I have no idea. I'm going to look it up. The Warcry War Bands, as, I'm, as soon as I... That have fans? Yeah. Give me the keywords and I'll Google it for you. Warcry. I'm on the Games Workshop website already because I just okay. look at it all the all right, time. Okay, you got it. Um, war Bands, shop now. Yes, please. Oh yeah, they put all the Age of Sigmar warbands together. Oh, I've pre-ordered the Spheranx model, the Mind Stealer Spheranx, like this big cat beast. Oh man, it looks so cool. Uh, Corvus Cabal, I'm super pumped to paint. We have that. Ah, the Cypher Lords. They're like these robed fans, like these sort of like ninja-esque warriors. They look sweet. I would, I would love to paint those. Sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. And so the fans, it's like more of that those flat areas where you can like add designs and stuff. Um, so I think we're getting pretty close here. I might use this blue to just add a little texture to the black straps, maybe even like a gray. Blop a white, blop a black. <laughs> Just so it doesn't look like just a blank area. Might be too dark. Are there any colors that you shouldn't, like if you mix your own gray, are there any colors that are like, don't even try buying this? Um, like you should just mix it yourself, is that yeah. what you're saying? That That's kind of, in general, that is a good note of like, most colors you can mix. Like you don't need to get pre-mixed stuff for everything. Um. I mean, you should you it's it's gonna be useful to have one of each of the secondary colors, you know, like greens and stuff, purples, but you don't need a million of them, right? I'm a hypocrite because I have like a bunch of purples here, but in front of me, but um, at a certain point, 
you can stop buying stuff and just experiment with what you have because that's what's going to kind of give you that fluency in your own collection where you don't need to buy new stuff. You don't need to buy the Games Workshop Ultramarines blue to paint Ultramarines. You can just say, hey, this blue is pretty close. I might mix a little bit of it. Excuse me, a little bit of this in there, and you're good to go. So it's just experimenting with the stuff you have. Um, but, you know, give, give yourself a dozen paints at least, like ivory black, couple of browns, green, purple, yellow, your primaries, your secondaries, all that. Um, but then at a certain point, just stop and experiment. Is there anything that's really hard to mix? Um, expect to have trouble with oranges. They're just the pigments kind of seem to be break apart really easily. It's going to be hard to have opacity. Like some colors you need to paint a different color first, like paint brown or something or red under your oranges um, just because they're really transparent and break apart. Oh, also, sometimes it's hard to tell how things are going to mix, and this is why I say experiment with what you have because a mixed paint has... It's not just a couple colors. It has elements of like white and black pigments and in, in, in odd combination to the point where when you mix them together, it might turn out gray because you don't realize how much white and black is actually in the mixture. So there are paints out there that are like pure pigments that are going to mix a little more closely to like what you would expect on the color wheel, I guess. Um, but, but in general, it just means experiment and learn how the colors you have mix. Do you have any techniques? to reduce or mitigate hand shaking in your paintings? Yes, um, the handle helps. That's one of the biggest things of the handle. Like, especially as you go along and get fatigued, like imagine holding a coin or something like this forever. You're gonna just get fatigued in a similar with this. So giving yourself a good handle, like I said, put some putty on top of a jar and stick it on there. Um, you want a couple anchors. So you can anchor your wrists like this and give you, give you this motion, and you can even give yourself one more layer of anchor with your finger or something. I like to avoid putting it on the model. Some people do that, but your oils can start pulling off the paint. So that's why if you have a handle like this, anchor here, anchor here, and like when you're doing an eye, you can really just get in there. And Good hat statement in the camera. You can really have anchor here, anchor here. Boop, almost no shaking. There you go. So it's not necessarily that, oh, I don't have steady enough hands. Wrist on the table, or forearm on the table, wrist together, finger on your base. You got three point three anchor points. Hardly any shake at all. So that's that will help. Um, metals, let's wash them up. Let's see. We can probably... I'm going to add the verdigreen stuff, so maybe I'll just do like a brown. The old strong tone. Because it'll work on both. The silver and the gold. This is one of those satisfying steps that's really simple, but will do a lot, give you a lot of leverage. Because it will start picking stuff out, adding some depth. So add a little bit of weathering. to it. I do still want to get some purple on this mask. But I don't mind adding brown too because I don't want it to be a brand new helmet. They're in the blood wind spoil and are in constant battle. <laughs> Cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and white can really be good in those colors also in the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, that's something I, that? I've, I've learned recently of like the color wheel. There's actually a different color wheel basically for pigments, mixing pigments, your physical paints, which is different than like how color schemes work together in pairs and triads on the regular color wheel. Um, so what they just have the cyan magenta that thing <laughs> cyan magenta yellow black and white yeah yeah they they they're your primaries your literally your primary pigments are different than and like color. primary colors yeah so how they interact together and how to achieve the full color spectrum with physical pigments uh, that you use that as your ba home base instead of the regular color wheel who 
that also what computers use? Yeah, well, that's a whole different thing, yeah, and it's that's working. The third one? Well, it, it's similar, but it 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 wor behaves differently because it's using light instead of physical pigments. Um, so it's how light is interacting together. So it is slightly different. Hmm. Uh, Finley said, thanks for the shaping advice, and he's going to, he recently picked up model holders, but hasn't had a chance to use them yet. Oh, man, yeah, it'll change your life. And, and literally just using anything. Like, I've used double stick tape on top of a little, you know, Tupperware thing for a little snack size thing. Um, experiment with what you like. Like, some people will drill a hole and stick a pin and put it in a cork, or just put the putty on a cork. Um, so there's, there's different ways you can do it. There's not one way, but... Um, experiment with something to hold and something sticky to put your model on and find your favorite. So, yeah, we're getting close. Okay, I gotta add this purple. I got my purple ink on my palette already. I'm gonna thin it out just a little because I want some of this metal and weathering to stick. Where's my glaze again? Also, just so you know, we're at 8 o'clock. I don't know if you want me to keep... 8 o'clock? Yeah. Well, we're getting close, so why don't I do a couple more little steps, and sure. then we'll take a ma maybe a little break? Sure. All right. So I'm just kind of letting, and this is something, too, that you're not always painting, you're not always, like, drawing like it's a pen or a pencil. I'm just letting the capillary action, that's why you want moisture in your brush, and I'm using thin paint, because these ridges are literally just pulling the liquid off of my brush. Mm -hmm and settling. It's like it's like like sucking it right off my brush. So let let the model work for you. Like that's one of the cool things about painting something that's three dimensional. That's why techniques like dry brushing and stuff work so well and washes and stuff like this. It's because you're using the three dimensions in your favor. A little too much in there so your brush can act like a sponge even where I just tap it and it takes a little bit of the paint off. Right off. <laughs> well, what, what, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna do one more okay two more steps. I'm gonna take a little bit of silver you can use any silver I'm using these brands I'm just pulled the brands I pulled arbitrarily I just was pulling call you can use any silver any blue or brown whatever. But I'm using Vallejo Silver just to highlight the metals. Get the highest points. Kind of using the side of my brush to let the, the again, the three-dimensional texture just pull it off for me. Using really light brush pressure and just letting whatever the highest detail is grab it off. It's not a dry brush that where you dry brush the highest details. You're just using light brush pressure and a small, small amount of paint and letting the model grab it. And here's a big secret that I, it blew my mind when I learned, is taking gold and highlighting it with silver. Ooh, secret. You know, it's kind of one of those things that you maybe wouldn't necessarily expect, but it works. Is it because it's kind of like a base that you're putting underneath it? It's like, like metallic. The, the, re the highest reflection on something metallic is like going to be like white or silverish, right. you know, on almost any metallic surface. So even though it's kind of a yellowish metal, the light reflecting directly off it is still going to be that like really whitish, silvery tone. Uh, Frostbite says, I could watch this all day. Jordan Yay. was planning tutorial videos to reach a broader audience. Yeah, we're we're doing a bunch of painting streams. And a bunch of, speaking of tutorials, there's like build streams. So if you want to learn how to use our products and like all the cool ways that they can go together, stay tuned for those streams. We're going to be painting Dwarven Forge miniatures. So some of the stuff that I've painted... Um, for the Kickstarters, we're going to paint on the stream so you can learn how to do that. And I am also interested in like doing some old schemes or like taking the base paint scheme and then seeing where we can go from there and adding a couple of effects to kind of punch up. So even if you bought a painted miniature from us, you can add a couple steps on top of it to kind of punch it up. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of stuff coming your way. 
I just want to grab the edges a little more. I don't want to touch that because that purple is still drying a little bit. So that's one of the biggest things too. It's really, you know, I get impatient. I get tempted to just start touching the paint, but it's almost dry. It's not quite. And if I were to start trying to manipulate that paint, it would li literally just tear right off. It would just come right off and look like a little coffee stain. How long does it like take to dry normally? Um, paint? Well, so that's part of the experimentation because uh, like your acrylics, especially the, the really transparent layers like we did with the skin, will dry very quickly. But these, these inks are heavily, heavily pigmented. There's more pigment in there. Um, and they take a little, like your washes. I kind of use the ink as a wash and when we wash the other stuff, those take a lot longer to dry. Like sometimes you might even want to work on a different area for like 20 minutes just because you don't want to push. If there's a pocket of moisture, you need to let it all dry out. Um, but typically acrylics dry fast, but just pay attention, right? Like if I, I put my brush here and I saw some of these pools were a little, little wet still, don't touch that area, even tempted as I may be, leave it alone. Is that the only way to tell if it's still dry? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes because especially this ink, so some paints dry glossy, so it's not necessarily that it's wet, it's gonna dry glossy too. But it's, it's also part of like, I went to reach for it and I remember this is experimenting with my materials. I know that this needs a second to dry. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna leave it alone just because I've used this before. Um, so when I came back to the area where I used it here, I thought I'm gonna leave it. Um, so I think we're gonna add bubbles glue. So scientifically, sometimes these metals don't necessarily weather the same way. They don't have this color verdigree, that kind of thing. But you know what? We're living in a fantasy world. Everything is getting this color of blue kind of weathering. Because it looks cool. Agreed. Yeah, somebody flagged that about gold earlier where it's one of those that doesn't tarnish. So. Yeah, but like gold, like the, the bluish on the gold looks so cool. Yeah, that's why you can't How can you copper, not? Dude, you gotta try copper. <laughs> Like, but again, fantasy. Well, I'm and, and I'm kind of thinking too. I'm kind of thinking too. This gold, you know, it could be a more brassy, coppery metal anyway. It may just have an extra shimmer. Anyway, it's getting the vertigree. That's all I know. It's fool's gold. It's fool's gold. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it is now. <laughs> gotcha. Like, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, we're kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, just being really selective. Adding, let the capillary action take it into the corners where moisture would collect. You know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the less is more kind of rule. Um. It really oh dear, I got it low. Off here, this is why working thin is good. Use your brush like a sponge. And it's almost like an eraser. It's gone. A little bit there, that's why I work on the wet palette. Have a little bit of the skin, touch it up. Uh, what's the technique that you're using to make your brush wet called? When you don't dip it. <laughs> it's uh, something that should be avoided, because it's going into my mouth. It's called brush licking. And uh, I will note, because a lot of people think it's gross, which it is. I do not do it when there's paint on it. I rinse it, and it gives it, your spit is a little bit thicker to get the point back together, and it almost works as a medium on here. The scrub, scrub, scrub. But you shouldn't do it often. But, like, real question, though. Do you notice that it works differently with paints than yeah. water? Would? Yeah, it, it does. It's literally, like, imagine spit. Like, you're mixing yeah, spit onto the paint. So okay. so it's, it's thicker. And so you, it's almost like you're... Uh, Imagine trying to sculpt soup or sculpt putty. Okay. Right? Like, I hear you. Something like that. See, that really punches out that metal. We just did two spot, two little spots, and it makes it way more exciting already. Do it by these things. And because I thinned it down with quite a bit of water, so you can, like, this is going to dry much less bright, and the area might shrink a little bit. So you can... 
you know, if it looks like too much when you first apply it, fear not. Just let it dry and it's probably going to look okay. Let's do a little up here. A little bit on the chains down here. On the buckle. All the metal parts. Hmm. Trying to pick a place for the helmet. Right on the like where would moisture collect? Kind of in the little pocket here. Maybe ooh, this is kinda of cool. Cool effect. Your fingers are porous too, so you can even dab it off like that sometimes, but what about smearing? Yeah, like so you you don't want to be too hard because your dry layers below can still get pulled off. Mm -hmm. But just if you just tap it, it'll sometimes work. If you have excess. I was just taking off some excess paint because I got it on a spot I didn't want it. But I kind of like that there's a bluish in the eyes here. So it's like kind of the same as the verdigris, but it also gives it a cool eye. Mystical, magical eye look. That looks yeah. sweet. Um, yeah, let's see. I might call that good. We might just work on the base and... Uh, Oh, you know what? I pulled some paints for the base. I'm going to grab them real quick. Two seconds. Uh, while you're grabbing that, Finley Shard says the sort of thing is one of the reasons I really like TTRPGs and LARP is, I know, <laughs> You can end up researching and finding out so many more interesting things as it becomes relevant because you want a realistic representation of something. I literally have them all here. Oh, I, I did bring them. Okay. He's still looking for this one. But here yeah, they are. Them. But dumb dumb. All right, so just like I did with the crazy purple base coat, I'm going to do something crazy on the base too. I'm just going to slap a bunch of colors on there. Just to get some some interesting shades, mix them all together, and then we're gonna dry brush over the top to pull them together. So if you were to look up close, it might kind of look like a little hodgepodge, but from table's eye view, when you're playing, it's gonna look a little more interesting. So I have Picorni's Base Wood, which is one of my favorite colors, the uh, kind of a reddish brown. Actually, my top favorite color is probably Deep Lava, which is this rich, dark red color way too much but the pipe was clogged and I poured it out um, and I also have olive dry brush so I'm just gonna try these out haven't used these before in combination but we're just gonna start slapping on color so I'm going to the base here I used some Vallejo textured paint that dried overnight and then I had actually these are little cork bits for the larger rocks Okay. and I just had those like spilled everywhere over my desk because I was carving up some <laughs> cork for some other bases and there was a scrap hiding in the corners of all parts of my desk. So I was a, grabbed a tweezers and as the, the this texture paint was drying, I uh, just plucked them on there. Have you ever painted a base that took, like required more attention than the mini? Uh, yes. I absolutely love basing, scenic basing. I think it adds so much to the, the final result. It just makes it look more finished and exciting. It adds more to the story. You're giving them an environment, right? And it's just so fun to play with materials like the cork and stuff. Um, I've added slate, pieces of slate. I've used mulch from the garden, like the bark, and painted it like rock. Um, stuff like that. You can go sci-fi, you can go kind of city, industrial. Um, I mean, really, you can just go nuts with it. So I don't know if it's a little loose. So this might even be a little too much. I'm going to just kind of blend these together a little more. Not to make them so starkly different across. But I do kind of like the different shape. Oh, this boy, this boy is a little loose. I might, I might actually have to tug that off, which I don't mind because we also have tufts, little tufts that we're going to stick on the base. What landscape is this on? I'm kind of doing like a, a desert, but like chaos desert, like the warp desert. So supernatural, kind of desolate region. 
So not necessarily true to life, but definitely dangerous. I mean, we already had fantasy gold, you know. Yeah. All right, yeah, so this is looking kind of cool. So we're going to let that dry. We'll do a dry brush. Yeah, so this guy, I mean, this is pretty much how I want her to look, I think. Um, we'll, we're, we'll let the base dry, dry brush it up, paint the room, slap some uh, tux on there, and call it good. So this is kind of the final result. Let me know what you think. Um, if you have any ideas yourself, I think we'll take a little break here. So thanks for watching. Be right back.
All right, welcome back. Whoa. I'm in the speakers. Hello, Echo. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're in the home stretch here. I'm just going to finish up this base. And uh, we'll have settled on this scheme. So I just grabbed a light flesh tone. This is Armin Painter album Flesh. Um, I'm just going to do a quick dry brush over these sloppy layers we mixed together. Maybe give it a wash. So we'll start with that. Dab 1800 says, by the way, Dread Hollow is amazing. Oh, man, I freaking love Dread Hollow. And I'm so glad that I'm painting some of the prototypes. Uh, that we saw in the last stream because there's elements of the Dread Hollow scheme which I didn't paint at all in Cameron's Deep, so it's been fun to learn that. And I have, I got unpainted Dread Hollow at home, so I have a lot of painting ahead of me. Uh, Finley Shard says, I've been bad. Cameron's Deep has arrived, but I'm not going, uh, I've not got my next gaming session until the end of March. I've not had the opportunity to open it up and look at everything yet. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I have not opened my stuff. It's just a mountain of boxes. And I get excited every time I see it, but also intimidated. <laughs> Do you have unpainted? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Oh, everybody likes the close-up. Thumbs up on the close-up. Oh, nice, nice. Shout out Selena. Yeah, Selena did some... Uh, oh, shout out some video snappy video. Vis video wizardry video during the intermission. <laughs> I might give it a little extra of this flesh because I think I'm going to wash it so it'll take it down a notch. So I don't need to be too conservative with this because I will knock it back down. I get nervous around the feet because I don't want to leave like a little patch of like I was obviously avoiding. I missed a spot but I don't want to brush color on the feet. Do you just go back with a smaller brush? <clears throat> so for the dry brushing, I'm using this flat brush. This is old flat brush I had just cause to pick out the texture. Um, but you do just got to be a little more careful. It's not necessarily smaller because it's a big flat area, but I do like that I have kind of this little tip to form a little point around the feet. So yeah, I, guess, I suppose it is just using that smaller area of the brush. And how do you know that your brush is dry enough? Uh, Dumb Dumb DZ says, I always leave it too wet and have to redo everything. Dumb Dumb DZ. <laughs> that, look, that that is uh, one of my cousins who gave me my first miniature ever. Oh, That's Dumb Dumb DZ? Dumb Dumb DZ. Oh, man. Yep. Welcome to the stream. Yep, VIP. It was a uh, Warhammer Vampire Counts ghoul. There was a, a, a trio of them, like, holding a bone over their head and a rock and stuff. So dry brush where it all began yeah so um you really got to take off more than you think because the idea is you don't want any of the moisture from the paint you don't want any moisture on your brush from your paint water and you don't want any moisture on the paint either so like you really if at any point and you want to get each part of your brush because sometimes there's a clump that's still wet where if you were to go all of a sudden you would hit that chunk and it would just streak across so you want almost no paint at all and so sometimes even after you wipe it off once you might want to go back because you need enough pigment also remaining that's dry on the brush to actually get color off but basically that's why these paper towels that have a texture are nice because you can kind of see where there's there's no more wet paint coming off but you're still getting some pigment on the texture so that's how you know but you can be loose of it because when it's such a heavy texture like this you can it takes some finagling, but you can get away with wet paint on here. Like, if, if I just just barely scrape some of it off, if I use really light brush pressure and just hit the top, I can do a pretty quick job if I'm in a hurry. Let's see here, I just got some on my mouth a little bit, so you gotta be careful. But you just don't wanna press down too hard. Even when you're doing regular dry brushing, you, you never wanna, this is the, 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 the trap with dry brush. This is the trap with dry brushing, is you never want to push down hard. You're always using light brush pressure. And if you start feeling like you have to push down hard, go back for more paint and, and dry it off. Because as soon as you start pressing down, you're going to hit those chunks and hit the streaks and hit areas that you don't want. So keep it light, like a feather duster. And there's a way to go back with it? Yeah, just get more, Some more paint. Just more paint, rub it off, feather duster. Never more than, than a feather duster, really. Do you have to go back and forth if you do too much and then, you know, keep going back and forth if you keep 
putting on too much of the dry and then you have to go back with the base layer. That's how I was trying yeah. to fix it before. Some, yeah, sometimes okay, you, uh, you know, you can always go back to the previous color and fix your mistakes, which I might actually have to do here where I hit, this is the beauty of a wet palette where I still have this color here and I can just touch this up. Uh, Jasmine Ambassador says, I want to try painting a hole in powder, but I'm also worried I'd start, never finish, and thus never be able to play it. Yeah, so when you have a bunch of pieces that you want to paint, you have to break it up into smaller batches. Like, I guess in theory, it would be maybe more efficient to do one step on every single piece, but it's not efficient for motivation. So you want to get like maybe up to six pieces at a time, especially if it includes big pieces. Don't do more than that just to keep your motivation up and you get that boost from finishing a chunk of pieces. Um, so have your whole encounter out, but get through just a few pieces at a time and that will, that will help you out. All right, we still have some of our dark brown wash on here, so I'm just gonna slap it on. I'm slapping the base, as Letitia, our <laughs> graphics wizard, said. Getting this all over the base. Giving it a little depth. And again, we're going to get some tufts on here, too. So that'll look cool. And this wash, especially, I kind of like when, when I put tufts on, sometimes at the base of the tuft, I add a little bit of this wash just to kind of blend it down to the base so it doesn't look like a, you know, quite as stark of a chunk. Chunk o foliage. Chunk o fo. Chunk o fo. Um, we got a question from Nikiva. How do you know when enough is enough? I would think that you can always add more than too much. Haven't painted, but interested in, but not sure about my skills. Yeah, that's something I've been struggling with too, because you want it to be your very best, right? So, but at a certain point, you just kind of have to let the model be what it is, let your progress be what it is, and move on to the next one and use what you learned there for the next model, like. Especially for the tabletop where we're, we're painting for a game where I, I kind of could work on this cloth area a little more, but I'm just going to leave it because I do like the textures happening and the different volumes happening. Um, but I but we got to do a whole warband. we got eight other models here. So I kind of just want to leave it and trust that as a whole they're going to look good. And then if I were to paint the next war, when I, when I do paint the next warband, I'll use the lessons from this group here for that. So just kind of... Let yourself put a bookmark in it. Uh, uh, let each project have its conclusion um, and carry your lessons forward. So, you know, your, your next piece is always going to be slightly better. So it's not that, don't focus on the last one being worse, being focused on the next one being better. Uh, Dum Dum Doozy also said, thanks, man. I should finally paint those space wolves. Yes. Oh, man. I've, he sent me some pictures of the space wolves he has painted. They look great. I mean, they're just such cool models. And that's power armor again, and and he even said it. It was just like as soon as you get those edge highlights on that power armor, it just pops. It looks awesome. Uh, Finley Shard says, "Do you guys ever cross skill train in the office? So get the painter sculpting and the sculptor's painting. I know some people can do everything. I mean, more the more specialized people." Yeah, there's definitely people have a lot of different jobs here. Um, I don't do the sculpting. I don't have a lot of experience with that. But a lot of the sculptors have definitely helped with painting. Uh, in the past and people hired for like like Toby learned to sculpt on the job I'm pretty sure like he was just doing his LED stuff and uh, working odd jobs and then all of a sudden he's like I want to sculpt and he did it um, so that's this is why it's such a cool place to work is like you do have an opportunity to learn new skills um, the video assistant Gabe uh, is recently moving on to Photoshop some graphics for us because we need some help there so there's a bunch of cross pollination happening um, I'm just going for black base from now we're, we're getting to the to the home stretch here This is like the punctuation mark. Get the nice clean base Bring room. The mini up a little bit. There you go. Yeah. Thanks. I know you might get shaky hands, but. Mm-hmm. Gotta be careful. I shouldn't be. I don't like touching the model how I am, but I always get excited at this step because we're so close to being done. I just want to get this whole rip. 
All right. How far away do you put a mi uh, mini to determine how happy you are with it to be table ready? Well, so that's kind of the trick, is when you're painting it, you're looking really close, and that is information you want as well, because you can see all the fine little marks and everything up close. But it is just as important to literally stand up. The amount of times that I'm painting a piece, uh, and I just stand up and look at it, uh, it is nuts. And look in different lights. Here's a great example. I like painting under this light because you can see the colors best, but oftentimes warm light will show you the contrast a little more. So Down on the mini. this is a yellower light. So this will give you different information about your your application of, of colors and, and contrast and stuff. So look at it under different light. Take it outside for a second. I'm telling you, you'll learn a lot by doing that. Just like put it near a window as opposed to under your lamp. Um, look at it from different heights and all of that will help you. What's the longest time you've ever spent on one mini? Boy. <laughs> um, let's see. There was one miniature, it was this Minotaur miniature that I think Nate got from Kickstarter or something. He just put it on my desk. He said, hey, just paint this whenever. It wasn't really an urgent thing, so I probably put in like at least 30 hours on that thing. Just, you know, whenever I had some downtime, I would pick away at it. And it's turned into one of my favorite models. Just, it's one of those things of like experimenting with different steps and just leaving your sins behind and covering it with next steps. Not trying to really fix anything, but just layering stuff on top, hiding mistakes, fixing stuff as you go, trying new things on top of past experiments. And it turned out really cool, so. That's also sage wise advice. Just keep covering up, keep covering up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. So I think this is this is this is this is good to go. We'll glue some tufts after the wash dries, you but bring I, th it down a little bit? I think this is our scheme. Give them a little twirl. I think this oh, is our scheme. There you go. Oh, this is Harold. This is Harold. Hey, Harold. A new recruit to the unmade. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make something of myself, ma. <laughs> I'm gonna go out in, into the blood when spoil. How old is he? He's sixteen. Oh wow. He's buff. He's lean. Look at him. Yeah, yeah. Did he finish school or? Yeah, I, I think I don't think I, uh, I think they, their only sustenance is uh, bloodshed, so they're not eating a lot. What but, more do you need? Yeah. Um, so that's exciting. So this will be cool. We've kind of done some experimenting with the colors here. So as we paint more of them, it'll go a little bit faster and we'll get more efficient with our process. So we should be able to finish this warband in the next stream. So for now, I think we'll keep batching away at that skin as uh, we wrap up here. So Harold is the first completed miniature of the warband and of the stream. That's exciting. And what's this one's name? Well, what do you think? Why don't you name this one? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, gotcha. No. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. No, wait, no. Was that a your saying? Uh, you you said it was. Well, okay. This looks like Lady Liberty first off. Lady Liberty. Oh, yeah. But that's I not like her that. name. Okay. Um, her name is Morticia. Morticia. Yeah. That's sweet. You can tell. What? <laughs> Just look at her. Yeah, oh yeah, she looks evil enough for that name. Give me, oh, you're painting. Yeah, I'm just getting some yeah, more paint out of the pot. Out. Some of this deepkin flesh. Uh, best stepmom ever said, good job. I really like the detail. Thank you. And then Drew said, my own rule of thumb, whenever in doubt or going around in circles, change, swap out your A, light source, B, light angle, or C, brush slash tool. Yeah, that's that's really smart, and that's why I think it's also smart too to like to have a couple projects on on your mind at once, because if you kind of are losing steam on something, you can just pick up a different model, and you'll be surprised how fast the time goes. You're like, ah oh, man, I think I got to put the brush down, but I'll just pick at this for a little bit, and just switching it up at all, kind of gives you that second wind. So how do you pick your palettes? I know you did mostly purple for this one, but the color schemes? Yeah, I know, and this is pretty close to the box art. It, it, yeah, it's pretty close to the box art, but I did think about things like I kind of wanted it to be 
the first thing I, I think about is like the attitude and the vibe I kind of want to give off. So I stuck with cool colors. The color temperature is one of the first things I think of. Like, is this cool miniature or a warm miniature? Um, so just kind of the uh, the spookiness of these guys and made me want to go with cool colors. Um, and then I kind of was just like looking at the color wheel a little bit, looking at the box art. I wanted to keep colors close together, uh, like blue, purple are kind of close together. Um, it kind of makes it, I don't know, to me it kind of makes it look like a little more ghostly, I guess, like they're kind of uh, ghastly coming in and out of the fog and the void. Um, so those wispy colors, like a fog, would kind of be colors close together, but hints here and there of little variants. Um, so I don't know, just, just pulling inspiration from things like that, like the fog and the spook, How do spookiness. You keep uh, temperature from being either too cool and too dead or like too hot? Well, this is kind of the trick, and it's something I'm still playing with, mm -hmm. where if you want to go cool, you want to add some, some warmth to it. So that is why when I'm like, okay, I know I'm using purples and blues, um, for the skin, I still added a little bit of red into the skin tone just to warm it up. And I knew that the base was going to be warm, so they will kind of balance each other out. So if you want like a stricture, it's it's kind of fun to experiment where if you have cool shadows, add some warmth to your highlights. Like even just as much as picking ivory over titanium white. Um, use that to highlight your cool colors. Maybe use like a blue gray to highlight a warm color to mix into your base color and highlight a warm color. So just that adding that contrast of again different types of contrast not just light and dark but cool and warm you know put a cool thing next to a warm thing so the blue cloth next to the reddish skin kind of uh, you know it looks cool to the eye hmm. this is a zealot minotaur this is what? Zealot miniature? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that was a Zealot miniature. The, Zealot, uh, sorry. The, the Minotaur I painted that I was talking about, yeah. Yeah, that, that one was a really cool miniature. Just like really... It, it was I was going to say exaggerated, but it was proportionate. Like it looks exact, but like the muscles are just rippling. Like it's it has just that extra 10% of, of fantasy, right? Where like it's just an... an uh, magnification of like reality so it looks like real muscles but they're just like just waves of them is it like the dehydration effect yeah yeah okay, that kind yeah. of thing yeah so for like people that don't, don't understand i guess uh what was it the witcher the right star had to get like didn't it drink water for three days just oh yeah Ga like game muscles? of thrones in that yeah and like wolverine like all those shirtless shots they're like really unhealthy for a day <laughs> to like yeah. get to the shape Skin just lays different when it doesn't have any moisture turns on. Yeah. You can tell when old people, too. <laughs> and it you heard it here first, folks. You heard it here first. I've had a long day. I'm an old person, too. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, people are going to be chanting for you to win just because I uh, stepped on a lot of toes. <laughs> <laughs> Nikiva said, okay, boomer, LOL. <laughs> <sighs> oh, man, I just noticed, like, this one has, his hand is holding a sword, but this one's arm is just a sword. <laughs> oh, nice. That's cool. I might even use this flesh tone. So they have, like, some flayed skin here. So I'm going to use this deepkin flesh here, but I probably won't add the red wash. Just keep it less lively since it's not on the body anymore. It's got a little thin. So this kind of shows the difference of this is the same color, but there's a little bit different moisture levels across them. So this is one layer of each. 
but the coverage is different. So that's a, you can experiment for different effects, how you can manipulate the moisture for the same, for different effects of the same paint. Do you think it's a coincidence that suede sounds so much like filet? <laughs> makes you think. You know, it makes you think. That's, uh, like you you know you ask the you ask the, the the tough questions, Mace. I you know I really like to crack. That's why we keep gotta, you around. Gotta keep you tough. Yeah. <laughs> it's part of being a boomer, you know. Right. I'm, now I'm just trying to look at the model. I think this is flesh here. So are all these gonna have the same color base? Yeah. Okay. Cool. And uh, the other two warbands are already painted. The bases are similar, so when they play together, they'll kind of look like they're on the same battlefield. Same cork yeah. on the terrain. I don't remember if I used cork for the big rocks. I think I just had, you know what I think I had? I think I had kitty litter. Oh, yeah. I've heard a lot of, like, kitty litter gets very finely gridded, right? And it gives a variety of rock sizes, too. Yeah, yeah. So you can kind of pluck a couple of them out. Well, do you have a cat? No, I stole some from my former roommate's cat. Did they know that you stole some? No, I took like a little tiny baggie of it out of a giant... Was it clean? No, it wasn't used. Are you sure? A hundred per... Well... <laughs> <laughs> it was out of the bag, though. Yeah, it was out, okay. of, the, out of the bag. You know, if you see a guy that brings stinky miniatures, though, <laughs> he can blame you. <laughs> oh, guilty. The skin is close to the primer, so I'm kind of looking at these like, which ones do they paint the skin on? We're in the home stretch here. We got maybe two more, including the blissful one. Does this one have a name? This is Harold's twin brother. Oh. Henry. Two H names. Their parents were very creative. Yeah, yeah. That's why they left. They left, left, left their boring home, you know? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> where was their What? Home? This is their backstory. Okay, yeah, but where was it? Ohio. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And how boring. Well, it was boring until a, a portal, a warp portal, appeared in their little cul-de-sac. And they woke up like, well, we're not in Ohio anymore, man. Yeah, they used to look pretty humanoid, too. Like, a lot less... Uh, Th these are my characters, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Cossack Cam says, I think living in Ohio is enough reason to leave Ohio. <laughs> you know what, though? I'll tell you what. Yeah, I grew up in Minnesota. And I was like, God dang it, I've just been here forever. i got to get out of here. And... Now I like going back. I had to leave to, you know, realize, all right, it's not so bad. Ohio, I've never been to, though, so who knows. I've driven through Ohio, but, yeah, I don't know. I've just heard that, well, I'm, yeah, I'm done stepping on people's toes. Stop. <laughs> I forgot Somebody about that. Somebody in the office just said I'm from Ohio, so now I'm getting judged. You're bullying me. That's why I'm so mean. Uh, Nikiva's from Wisconsin. Oh, Nikiva nice. West is the best. I'm actually from Iowa, Nikiva, so I fully agree. <laughs> and TVH, I think Wisconsin's the best state in the Midwest, so. It's pretty cool. I was going to Duluth, so we would, like, you know, go over to Superior, right across the bridge. Mostly to get beer. Yeah. <laughs> Why else would you? Let's see. All right, we just got our big miniature left, which actually there's not a lot of skin on this one because they've cut off their limbs and grafted on the stilts and stuff. And that stamp work done. Yeah. This one is about as big as this holder can take, so it's a little stubborn. There we go. And this one... The blissful one. The blissful one is named dot dot dot. What? Oh, I thought you were you had oh, you something for me. me. Well, I thought you sounded like you had something no, ready I'm to go. Oh, new one, man. I'm your oh. Uh, okay, okay, I can think of one. Uh, it's uh oh no. Uh, 
it's Ronnie. Ronnie. <laughs> you have to but say it with that inflection. Yeah, yeah, it has to be that it's inflection. Not Ronnie. 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 <laughs> Just imagine, like the like, their enemies on the battlefield. <laughs> what Ronnie. comes hither? It's it's Ronnie. <laughs> uh, Nikiva loves that name, so I guess we're doing okay. <laughs> that is awesome. All right. Yeah, only a little bit of skin left on this person. They're so devoted to the gods of chaos that. Very little flesh left. That's what happens when you have me. <laughs> All right. Well, I think let's go back to this guy. And uh, let's see. Are we painting next Tuesday also? Um, a week from now? I believe we... Let me double check before I, yeah. you know, sell my soul or anything. We are painting next Tuesday. All right, so we should finish these up here. And I'm really excited. I like how this scheme turned out. Yeah, it's nice. All right. Well, I think we'll call it here. Thank you so much for watching. This is our first painting stream, and I've been so excited to do this. I was working on building these guys today. I was really excited to just throw some paint around with you. So please come on back next week and stay tuned for other streams coming up this week. What do we got on the docket? On Thursday, we actually have a build with Nate where he's going to do his build that he's going to be taking to PAX. Uh, and then Friday, we have a game with Stefan. The PAX build is at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so you do the math wherever you are. <laughs> and then Stefan's game is 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well. And we have Greg Tito on, which is very exciting. And then Jolly Blackburn and I think Barbara Blackburn and a few other guests as well. So that's going to have a lot of people in the office. So stay tuned if you want to see that stream. Thanks for coming in. Um, anything else? Do you want to post your, have your social media handles or anything? If they... uh, let's see. If you search Mojo Hamster, you should find me. Instagram, Mojo Hamster Live. Twitch and Twitter, Mojo Hamster. So follow me if you like. I plan to do some uh, more miniatures. So right. thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.